So, uh, anyway, I'm Jim Briggs, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. And I've known them both for a long time. Uh, Paul uh, came to Williams when I came to Williams. Only I was I came as an administrator. He came as a student, and I spent four years watching him play football. Uh, I didn't know that he was going into the art world at the time. And uh, Jay lives in Williamstown, and we're both on the board together and so forth. So I, I'm going to introduce him. And, uh, but we never see each other except for at Canterbury. That's right. And something <laughs> always happens. So we, um, anyway, first let me introduce Jay. Um, she is a class of 84 graduate of Canterbury, is the Manton cur uh, Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Mass. Graduate of Holy Cross, received her PhD from Brown in 1999, served as a curator uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago from 1997 to 2009, taught graduate seminars at the School of Art Institute at Chicago from 2001 to 2008. She's the author and editor of several important books and articles, including Becoming Avard Munch, Influence, Anxiety, and Myth in 2009. She's a fellow board member, which I've already mentioned, and her dad is here. And mom. And mom. <laughs> in the class of so, she will be uh, a part of it. Paul Tucker, as I mentioned, I've known him for a long time, and the rest of his family. Uh, <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> Paul is the Paul Hayes Tucker Distinguished uh, Professor of Art at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He received his PhD from Yale in 1979. Hailed by Time Magazine as America's foremost authority on Claude Monet and Impressionism. Uh, Paul's career at UMass began in 1978. He's studied with academic awards, honors, and he is a prolific writer. And I started looking up his books, and I'm not even going to start. <laughs> I wear you out just telling you what they all are. Uh, he's a great demand as a great as a speaker at museums. Uh, and uh, galleries uh, you know, worldwide. Most recently, he did an exhibition of, on Monet at the New York Br Britannical Garden. Paul has four brothers who went here, and uh, his, his brother Peter is running the Society of Alumni. Uh, and uh, I just will introduce both of you, and it's all yours. Thank you very Thank much, Jim. We thought we'd begin uh, sort of at the beginning and have a, a, a conversation uh, about these issues relating to the organization of blockbuster exhibitions, which have become the staple of major institutions around the country. Uh, it was a delight to be able to speak with Jay about this. I figured I got the troika, the whole trinity. I got Jay. I got my brother Peter, and I got Jim Briggs attacking me to be able to do this thing, so I, I act yes. Uh, I think there's some passage, you know, past St. Peter as we get in for, for this kind of contribution. Uh, but um, out of curiosity, as to, for, certainly out of biographical, how did, how did the art history side happen in your side? Then I'll tell you. Okay. You tell me and I'll tell you. Good. Um, well. The, the most important beginning for me was when my parents took me traveling in Europe when I was young. Um, I was very fortunate to travel um, really all over Europe with them, and I think that got me interested in other cultures. It's all about mom and dad. I can never thank them enough, truly. Um, and then the next part is the amazing education I was afforded, um, both at Canterbury, at Holy Cross, and then for my PhD at Brown. But Canterbury was really where the intellectual bug bit me. And um, when I was in grammar school, um, I didn't, you know, I worked very hard, but I wasn't that excited about school. And then here at Canterbury, I, what struck me was the idea of interdisciplinary studies, how art relates to history, relates to politics, psychology, English. And um, that included with Kim, I'm not sure if Kim Tester's here, I think I saw her earlier. Um, I took printmaking classes with her and then sculpture class with Sylvia. 
And the practice of art here at Canterbury, where a lot of schools, as you know, are cutting their art programs um, because they think it's not going to make you money down the road. But the, the arts are obviously extremely important. So I think the combination of interdisciplinary studies, being excited about learning and making art here, um, and then throughout my career really got me going. I am jealous. <laughs> because when I came to Canterbury, first and foremost, there were no women, like many, many men in Canterbury. So that's the first note of jealousy, which I think we all would share. Second, there was no art. There was, yeah. there was, there was no art department. There was, there was nothing art. The only art we got was in the books where there were illustrations. And I can still remember <clears throat> the very first week of being here, perhaps some of you may as well, I was, of course, terrified, absolutely terrified. Not only by being here, but likewise having an older brother who was a year older than I, who had already established a certain reputation, both for intelligence and for mm, connivory. And the class I remember first and foremost was none other than Jim Briggs's. And I, and I say this in all honesty, Jim, I don't know if I've told you this, but it was in the schoolhouse. It was the first classroom on the left-hand side when he came down the stairs. He had to kind of turn back a little bit into the classroom, and it had a set of windows behind me. And I can remember the seat I sat in, yeah. in that classroom. And the one thing that gave me, there were two things that gave me relief. One, that somehow you, you knew my brother, so I felt a little calmer, and you sort of called me out, gave me a shout out. But also, too, and this is so touching, <coughs> that do you remember the book that we used? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, Jim's had a long, distinguished career. The book was a, was a blue book, it was a blue history book, European history book. It was sort of smaller, shorter, tighter, stockier book. And it was Hayes and Moon. Hayes and Moon. Oh. Hayes and Moon, modern European history. And our grandfather was one of the authors. Oh. So I thought, oh, wow, this is terrific. All right, at least I might survive some hour. But now I've got another mountain to climb because he wrote the book. <laughs> And as Jim has said, I've been very happy to have had the opportunity to write lots of books. I never thought I'd be able to write a book. The idea of writing a book seemed absolutely insane, no less the idea about art. Our family, unfortunately, we traveled to the grocery store. We traveled to uh, the, uh, down the street to a school. Uh, and they drove us to our various schools. But that was it. We were not dragged to museums. So I had no experience, really, of museums and museum culture, really, until more or less going to college. And thank goodness Twin Sheehan was here. He took me personally up to Williams. I stayed with Mike Foley. I had a drink at 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, this is the place I want to go. <laughs> and I wanted to be a historian like my grandfather. So I was going to be history major, blah, blah, blah. But I thought I'd take other things because, hey, it was liberal arts. And they just got rid of all the requirements, so I didn't have to do that French, oh, Jules Bio, and, 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 uh, and uh, Vanessa, I forgive you. But let me tell you, I hated that French. <laughs> it was horrible. I, so I didn't do French, I didn't have to do math, so I took, oh, let's do some primate behavior course. That's great, get all those little chicks in there, hitting away and stuff, and mounting. And I said, let's do some art stuff, too. All right, so I went and took an art history class. They didn't do so well on it. I can't uh, really call somewhere, but somewhere in that sort of lower B, maybe you know, C plus, lower B. So my roommate, who of course was a wild guy, says, you're not going to take one of them again, are you? And I said, well, you know, actually it was really rather interesting. Anyway, long story short, I got into it primarily through that, through Williams, thank God, and the Troika of Williams College. And then on, the best part was that on my junior year, junior year summer, I saw an ad on a bulletin board. And bulletin boards are really important. Anybody who's in education can put things on bulletin boards because students still look at that. I saw an ad for a program to go to, to Florence with Sarah Lawrence. But whoa, double hit. <laughs> Make it up in Canterbury. Went to Florence for a summer. This was, in the end, absolutely mind boggling. And the best part about it was the fact I realized. I wasn't interested in the women, I was interested in the art. I was still very straight, I have to tell you. But nonetheless, the women just were not this, what, what my orientation was. I came back to Williams, that's, that's senior year. All I took were art courses to make up the major in the end. And then I saw a bulletin board again for an advertisement for an internship at the Toledo Museum. Went to Toledo, and there we go, there we go. So it's all been a great run. But the, the Munch show, your Munch show was, this was, I saw you were in Chicago, and saw that it was one of the great shows. It was just a terrific show. So, and to set the stage for what we're going to talk about in terms of what you'll see in terms of visuals, how did, how did that come about? 
Um, well, we're going to be going over that. Are you going to go in by, go by precluding? Okay. No, 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 yeah. this is totally fine. But what actually, when I, I, my dissertation was on art in Berlin in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll tell you the story about Monk, but the way I kind of started writing about him is I had to go to the Monk Museum to do research, which you're going to learn about, which is in Oslo, Norway. And the curator there said, you write about art in Berlin in the 1890s. Why do you ever write about Monk? He was in Berlin the whole time. Monk was actually Norwegian. And I thought, oh, good question. Then I wrote my next article on Monk, and many articles and books later, there you go. That's how you become an expert. But she was a woman I really, really admired. I really admired her scholarship, and she very much helped me with my few first few articles. And I think that's another really important thing about um, the journey that I've had is it's all really thanks to mentors. My undergraduate mentors, my mentors here at Canterbury, my undergraduate mentor, his name was Jody Ziegler at Holy Cross, who changed my life, um, and then in graduate school, Kermit Trumpa. You know, it's, it's really about those inspiring teachers that stand up there and make you want to think the big thoughts and do something new and, and change the world. So it's really them I have a lot to thank as well. Well, it's, it's like me and Williams. The, there are three professors of Williams who were sort of the Holy Trinity, <clears throat> they were uh, an Americanist, a medievalist, and a modernist. And they produced what became known as the Williams Mafia, which were individuals who went on from Williams to graduate school, then on to museums, and became, over time, the head of almost every major museum in this country. From right now, for example, the Museum of Modern Art is headed by a Williams guy. The National Gallery is headed by a Williams guy. The LA County is headed by a Williams guy. Atlanta is headed by a Williams guy. The list goes on and on. It's really, it's almost scary. It's as if somewhere or other there was water up there and, and we, all, we all drank. Now, those guys, and unfortunately, they are all guys. There's yet to be a woman graduate, but that will be coming. There are many women who are directors of museums. All those guys are actually. If you really want to know, they're the Sicilian brand of the Williams Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us are the Tuscan ones. <laughs> we sit upon the plateau and look down the boots of Italy to those guys who are on their motorcycles, like Tom Krenz, who was the head of the Guggenheim, oh, yes. right? Another Williams guy. <clears throat> they all, and even Jim, uh, Jim, um, Jim, Wood. Jim Wood, who was the head of Chicago. He was not only a Williams guy, but another big biker. We on the Tuscan level rode our bicycles. <laughs> we thought high thoughts. We were able to, to bridge the gap between academe and the museum world, thankfully, because the museum world is a very tough bit of business. Uh, Jay has survived with glorious uh, uh, credits and, and esteem, uh, but it is a bit of a rarity because, uh, just like in academe, in academe, it's all about blood and guts and warfare because there's nothing to fight over other than ideas. There's no money, so just go at it. And within museums, there's not a lot of money either. It's essentially about territory, it's about acquisition funds, it's about position, it's about relationship to the director, it's about relationship to clients, or in that particular case, the clientele of collectors, and how well you can establish yourself in that field. Even for, for Jay to have been able to accomplish as much as a scholar, which he had enormously, is remarkable because you have <coughs> no time. You have no time. There's a constant pressure upon you. So museum people have this kind of difficult to read and to work in. It may look great when you're in there and Jay takes you around to see a show or something because he's got 5,000 other things to do, but this is fine. We love to have it. It's fine. That's what we say. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really fine. <laughs> but I love you. Maybe you miss up. Uh, but just like in academe, everybody thinks, oh, there they are in the ivory tower. And you know, they all have that summer off. Summer off. Look at that, the summer <laughs> off. By God, if you didn't have that summer, you'd be shot. You wouldn't have a job because you would have time to do the writing and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of strains in both of our lives and both of our professions, which then become even more layered when it comes to taking out a huge project like a major exhibition which, as you'll hear from both of us, requires this enormous amount, not only just of sheer labor and intense physical capital, but a kind of mechanic <coughs> that's like running some big piece of machinery. You've got to know every part of that machinery as, as it cranks along. So there's someone in the museum world to take that on, uh, particularly at a major institution like the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, is a, a, an enormous accomplishment. So I'm thrilled to, to learn that actually really had its origins here in Canberra. I must say that 
in Jim's class and many others, I got my intellectual bearings, and I think I was still completely naive and a pup uh, by the time I even got to Yale. Uh, but uh, happily, a mentor there, a guy named Bob Herbert, who was an impressionist scholar. I taught for him for the very first semester, and he became my, my man uh, as I moved on. Which, of course, he sent me off to Paris as I was going to do my dissertation, and he kind of slaps me on the back. He was a very realistic guy. He was an utter Marxist socialist, too, which was a great uh, influence on me. He says, well, good luck. He says, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll probably get through this. I hope you'll get through this. It's got to be rough here. And he says, you know, and you know, if you, if you do do that, I suspect you might have a, a reasonable career. You'll write a lot of articles and so on and so forth. And I took that as a threat yes. you know, and a challenge. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the great things I love to feel is I, and we should say, should we not say? that everything that's said in the Milford stays mm -hmm. <laughs> stays in the room. There's, there's, there's going to be a few other little revelations during our slide presentations. It might be a little testy. I wouldn't want to see it on page six of the post. So if you might have some discretion about that. But anyway, I took it as a kind of test. And so I've now written more books than he did. Oh, yeah. Stick it to him. <laughs> Take that. dissertation advisors who is a professor at Williams College where I now teach and now he and I are friends. When I was finishing my oral exams, which is like, you know, running 15 marathons in a row, um, he said, so Jay, what are you going to be doing now that you finish your exams? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to go to Berlin, I'm going to have my six months of research, and he says, and then you'll come back here and write your dissertation. I said, well, no, in fact, um, I'm going to go back to the Art Institute of Chicago, they've kept my job, and I'll be writing my dissertation while I'm working. Oh, and he said, so when you're ABD, that means all but dissertation. So or, all or you have to do done. is write a 300 page book. And then you have your degree. And he said, looked me in the eye and he said, Jay, museums are ABD graveyards. You'll never get it done. So I took such a challenge and I wrote my dissertation in two years, working full time. And I said, so there. So you know, we still want to get back to the professor. Okay. Yeah, there, there is there is that kind of you know intensity on the inside because once again it really is once you go off to do a dissertation it's all you it's all you yeah. baby you know you can have a relationship with your mentor you can write and so on and so forth get some guidance but the responsibility does lie upon your shoulders and getting that thing done is a huge challenge most dissertations uh, particularly in art history are ten year affairs ten year affairs from the time you step out of graduate student having finished your uh, oral exams to the time you turn it in. So to be able to do it in, in three years with one year of research and, and with two years of writing is phenomenal, it's just phenomenal. Uh, but there is that, that sense of achievement that one rightfully feels about that. And then the best part, I assume this is true in your side, my dissertation was on Monet as well, as on the Monet's of the 1870s, is that thank goodness after spending all of this time on this material, that actually was worthy enough to become a book. Because people spend a lot of time on topics that might be of some interest, but don't actually make it from that dissertation into a book. So years' worth of effort are cast aside. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty tragic. Yeah, that, does, that happens to a lot of people. That's true. So. And the other thing that's remarkable about Jay too is the fact that it's rare to be able, <laughs> it's rare to, be able to work on a major artist. Monk is one of the most important late 19th century artists. And to be able to carve a space in that often very crowded uh, environment and be able to have your own voice within that is really a, a, another a, a, a serious achievement. And it's underscored not only by the fact that her scholarship has been so applauded uh, by, the, uh, by the Academy as well as elsewhere, but also, as I'm sure you know, <coughs> that uh, the, at least up until recently, uh, one of the most expensive works of art that ever was sold at auction was Monk's, uh, Monk's Scream. And that was sold for $119 million to Mr. Leon Black. Uh, and it's not a, it, it is an individual work, but it's one of a couple of uh, versions of that. So that particular artist is serious, both in terms of his contributions to the history of art, and likewise to the crazy economy in of, which, the yeah, of the art market in which we live and which will be uh, part of at least a couple of comments that only two. So one of the things we thought we would do is 
go through um, a series of images, kind of giving you a sense of how an exhibition gets put together. Um, from, you know, from the research side to hunting for paintings that you can't find anywhere. And there are so many fun adventures. Um, so I like that, fun. Fun adventures, absolutely. Um, so what, and we um, haven't seen each other's slides, so we're, we're done. Yes, yeah, this is we true. Have, this is going to be entertaining for both of us. So we thought, um, I would sort of tell my story, Paul will tell his, and then we, you know, open it up to questions, be very, you know, lively discussion, maybe some um, some fights will break out, we, one can only help. <laughs> um, so this exhibition um, was at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2009 called Becoming Edvard Munch, Influence, Anxiety, and Myth. And this um, this is the book on the left, and then this is the, um, the entrance to the exhibition, just to give you a sense of what it looked like when it was finished. And like many projects, it really began with one single work of art. This is a painting called Girl by the Window from 1892 by Edvard Munch. And it shows this woman in a white nightdress pulling back the curtains and looking out at a, um, at a moonlit and electric light um, across the way. The Art Institute of Chicago was going to buy this painting. But we didn't know where it was between the years of 1933 and 1937. So this is the period of Nazi war loot. Munch was considered a degenerate artist by the Germans. So his, his art could have been looted. Um, so I was sent, oh, and also a PS to this, this is another stay in this room. The person who's going to buy the painting for us, his name was Dan Searle. He had just been through a five year legal battle with a Duga landscape pastel that was Nazi war loot. So if we're going to ask him to pony up millions of dollars to help us buy this, we better make darn sure that it's completely okay. So I didn't necessarily know anything about Munch, but I had uh, French and German, and so they sent me to do the research at the Munch Museum. So um, I went through letters and letters and letters and books. This is just a, a sampling of what's in the, um, the archives of the Munch Museum, which are really, really incredible. It's like one-stop shopping for Munch research. It's, it's really, really fun for complete dorks like myself. <laughs> um, so I was going through all these letters, and what I was looking for was information about the painting, sort of the paper trail, who bought it, who sold it, you know, what, what the information was um, on this painting. And in the process of reading through hundreds and hundreds of letters, I thought, wait a minute, where's the crazy Edvard Munch of the screen? Where's the man who was hospitalized for alcoholism and mental illness? Wait a minute, he's a businessman, he's his own art dealer, he organizes all his own exhibitions, all his own publications, he is a mastermind businessman. And you also read in letters that he's marketing himself as the crazy maker of the screen. Like Van Gogh did not market himself. He's, he tried to through his brother. But in any case, I thought, well, there's a whole different story that no one's ever told us about Edvard Munch. And maybe that could make an interesting exhibition. So fortunately, we bought the painting. And then what happens next is this totally unglamorous process. At least this is how it's done in Chicago. It's done in different places everywhere where you have a storyboard. This is not the Milk exhibition, this is the Gauguin exhibition, which is in progress right now um, in Chicago. Sort of, these are the different rooms we want the exhibition, the stories we want to tell in each room. This is the period in Arles, this is the period in Brittany, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of storyboard an idea. Think about what, you could, what paintings you could possibly get or not get. And it's really, really hard to, to get people's famous um, Milk paintings, or you'll certainly hear Monet paintings. So then you get through that process, you say, okay, this is our list. I, an exhibition of 150 works, this is our wish list. Then you travel all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> this is just one, one page from my passport up there. Because you can't just um, write the museum in Wuppertal and say, can you send me your starry night? Because they'll say, everyone wants our starry night. You have to go there and tell them the idea of your exhibition and why they want to would want to lend you their painting, um, and then they think about it, and then you send a letter, and that's, so it's a very long negotiation process. You do that times 150, that's a lot of travel. And frequent flyer miles. <laughs> <laughs> so the Art Institute of Chicago had this very famous um, lithograph, uh, which is a print version of the screen. It's a multiple, um, and this is probably, you know, not only Munch's most famous work, but, you know, visual cultures, one of the most famous works like Whistler's Mother, or the Mona Lisa, is the screen. So we had the lithograph, but we didn't have a painting. And if you want to do an Edvard Munch show, you should really have a painting of the screen. So as Paul, laid, as Paul mentioned earlier, there's three different versions of the screen. So we thought, all right, it'd be great if we could get one of them. Now this one 
1893, the first version, lives in the National Gallery of Oslo. During the Lillehammer Olympics, it was stolen. It was recovered, and as a result, they will never lend it again. <laughs> the, next ver the last version um, is around 1910, was also stolen from another museum, the Munch Museum. Recovered, they will never lend it again. <laughs> The middle version, which I knew quite a bit about because, remember the girl looking out the window? Uh, she was commissioned by a German coffee manufacturer to make another version, to make it, there's a number of versions of this painting. And his name is Arthur von Franke. He wrote Monk, just saw your scream at an exhibition, will you make me a version, I'll pay you 200 kroners. So Monk didn't make this work of art because he, he felt like making, he did it on commission so he could make money. So this was in a private collection um, in Norway, and the man who owned it cherished it so much he built a supposedly nuclear war-proof bunker underneath his property to secure it. Didn't want to lend it to us, I can tell you that much. But this is the work that he then sold for um, you know, almost $120 million. So long story short, we never got one. Sure. But this is, and this is the sale at Sotheby's. It's actually an amazing, um, this is, has an inscription on it, and on the back, it has all this handwriting by Monk um, that describes the scene. Now, another painting, um, I'm not sure the paintings we got because those don't make it as good stories. One stranger than fiction painting, this is called Boys Bathing, and we wanted to borrow it. What you often end up doing is contacting art dealers because they know all the private collectors that own the paintings, specifically in Norway. This is one painting no one can help me find. Um, and so I asked another museum director, he said, I, I'm not going to mention any names here, he said, I know this guy, call him Mr. Guy, um, and he has access to the painting. So I met Mr. Guy in a restaurant in Oslo, and we're talking about the painting. He said, yes, I'd be happy to, to lend it to you. I have the paperwork. The whole time, his girlfriend is calling him on his cell phone asking him who he's having dinner with and what she looks like. <laughs> he doesn't know, as he's talking to her, that I speak Norwegian. So the whole time he's like, no, she's not pretty. <laughs> no, I, no, it's nothing like that. You know, she's married. She's, she's not that interesting. On and on and on. Just there, so. so then she calls like every five minutes. Finally, she shows up hugely pregnant and joins us for dinner. It's very strange. So this man, Mr. Guy, Said, pretended to sign the paperwork. He said, I'm going to hold on to this bit of paperwork and I will send it to you later, but we will lend the painting. Great. Sign, seal, deliver, the painting is done. One month before the exhibition opens, my museum director at the time, Jim Cuno, who's now director of the Getty Museum, gets a call from the owner of this painting. They say, the painting's in the warehouse. We haven't heard anything about, you know, when are you going to come pick it up? What's the plan? And so Jim calls me and I said, those aren't the owners. The owner is Mr. Guy. It turns out the actual owners with this very upstanding Norwegian family, Mr. Guy was pretending to be the owner of the painting so he could then fly to Chicago and sell it off the walls. To so let's say, okay, you want to buy it for four million dollars, then go to the family and say, I found a buyer, you get half for two million. So they never press charges, but you know, you can't make this stuff up. So it didn't come to the exhibition. Um, but it's been for sale ever since, so if anyone wants to buy an Edvard Monk painting, it's probably only $10 million. So um, then you get all your pictures, and then you have to sit down and write a book. And usually, not everyone has two children in the process of writing the book, but that's Liam, my little guy who's now 11 years old. And that was the office where I wrote the whole book. You'll notice there's all sorts of back padding, because you sit for hours and hours on it. Um, so then this is the book that came out um, in conjunction with the exhibition. This is the exhibition uh, finally on the walls, um, many different, the, one of the first rooms and one of the last rooms. So that is my story of how an Edvard Munch exhibition comes together. And if you think you have to do that once a year, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so now let me get, you, let me get your book. Now we get the story of Monet. Question. Please. So the screen uh, when, goes way, goes when they were when oh, those sorry. two were stolen, were they stolen while on loan? No. Or were they, they stolen were, out of the they collection? They were stolen out Off of loan. the museum, literally. Yeah, the um is this the first one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, during the Lillehammer Olympics, someone uh, 
took a ladder up to a window, walked in the window, took the painting out through the window on the ladder. The Monk Museum, they were, they were armed robbers. They came in with guns and the police in Norway and also the, the guards don't carry weapons and the police also don't carry weapons. So they stole it, they finally got it back a couple of years later. Did they end up paying a ransom to get it back? Or? They did not pay rent. That's a very good question. They did not. Um, I think they that was their hope, but they eventually put in jail. And the, the general idea, or the, what people say, is they didn't steal the painting to sell it, because you can't sell it. It's such a famous image. They stole it as collateral for drug transactions. Jackie? Just a, it's an interesting question, given the value of art because there's higher prices for art than for the screen these days. I think there's a picture that sold for 179 million within the past month. Uh, is does that what? How is that? What are the implications on the prices for for theft? Well, the, An appropriate um, question from a man from in the insurance world. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, thanks to Chubb. I don't know if you work for Chubb, but thanks to Chubb. In any case, right. um, everybody, everybody should have Chubb. Get Chubb, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Do you work for Chubb? Peter's ahead of Chubb ah, I did not know that. Head of Chubb in New York. If you're in New York region, see the man. He <laughs> <laughs> won't give you a deal, but he'll <laughs> If you go to Canterbury, there's a discount. Well, it's set in New Milford. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is for an exhibition such as um, this one, or one that just opened at the Clark, opens today, Vincent Van Gogh, huge, huge prices. So what you do is you have all the insurance values. We know the insurance values are of each work of art in the exhibition. What we often do is we call, we apply for an indemnity by the U.S. government. And the U.S. government will often give museums indemnification um, if something happens. So it's, and let's say the indemnification is for up to $400 million. If you have a Van Gogh exhibition, the chances are you're going to have to buy extra insurance for the amount of money that's, for the work that's in the building. Um, and then you have, the museum has its own insurance as well. So it's usually a combination of getting an indemnity, for an exhibition like Monet or Van Gogh or Monk, if you don't get an indemnity from the U.S. government, it, the exhibition may just be too expensive to have because you can't afford to pay the insurance. Another thing that happens is you have to apply for an application called immunity from seizure. So um, I'm sure you all remember what was in the news many years ago when an Egon Schiele exhibition was up and someone tried to claim these paintings as Nazi war loot and then the New York police came in and seized the works of art. So immunity from seizure basically make sure that whatever is sent from, let's say, Vienna to America for an exhibition will then go back. It won't get seized. It will be returned to its original owner. And those applications are hideous. I mean, they're just hundreds of pages. How do you know that when a work is missing uh, and it gets returned that you actually have the original work of art? In, in, instead of a copy or something? Instead of a copy. I mean, I know that that business has been moving. It is, and it's and it's and it's rife with corruption as well. I mean, there are lawyers lawyers that come after collectors or museums and say, "You have my work of art. We want it back." And you do the research and you realize it was never their work of art. So, you, I mean, copies, I mean, I think we usually an expert would get involved, and you would know if it was. I mean, if you're a private individual and you didn't know a real from a fake, that could be that could be problematic. But a, a museum or a scholar would cert would know if it was a fake or not. Well, well, there's that. <laughs> that's why I'm bringing it up yeah. because that's not always the case. No, well, you know, the, the fact that right. she is, it's a very good question because uh, I, on one hand, it could be an innocent question that she appropriately answers it. Experts, really, in theory, should be able to tell. And I'm sure, like Jay, I get inquiries twice a week from people around the world saying, Is this, I have no idea, it doesn't say, Is this? They say, I own. I'm on it, and I want you to comment on it or prove it or whatever else. And uh, almost all the time, their reproductions or their grandma's version of something, you can tell straight up just by the image they sent. <coughs> they are all seriously disappointed because they have these inflated notions of the value of the work if indeed it really was real. Uh, there are plenty of occasions, however, you look at the old master world like Rembrandt. There are arguments about whether it's real or not real. And those things are revised constantly. 
Uh, the guy, in fact, who just revised the Rembrandt catalog is a kind of showboat guy. Mm. And he, in fact, has, has reorientated the catalog by about 130 pictures. Okay. Right? Added 130 yeah. reels that, that were that, that The people had said previously, a group of, uh, a serious group of people, had said that they're not real. So, real, not real. There's actually a really interesting program on the BBC called Fake and Forgery. You can get it, there are YouTube things on it. And the first program they did was on a Monet. And it was a picture that was purchased at a rural auction in, in Norfolk, uh, England. And I saw it, and I thought it was perfectly legit. Not the greatest painting. <coughs> the guy who bought it was a lieutenant in the British Navy <coughs> and was a money aficionado. <coughs> Uh, he has spent the next almost 30 years, 25 to 30 years, he has spent his entire time trying to get this authenticated. Mm -hmm. uh, and the program, I won't tell you the, the end of it, but the program was so gripping that even my wife, who knew the ending, mm -hmm. screamed! <laughs> uh, when, almost a monk, you know, screamed uh, when, when, when this picture was presented. So it's a really interesting problem. And it raises other issues which uh, Jay would certainly uh, uh, rely upon. That is, for all of us in the business, there are things called catalog resumes. And catalog resumes are the collection of works known at the time that have got all the documentation that is possible, generally an image of the work, the uh, size dimensions uh, and uh, materials of the work, its past uh, history in terms of who owned it, where it has been exhibited, and where it appears in the literature. Those catalogs are absolutely essential for everyone's work, and every artist doesn't have a catalog designate, but those are really uh, incredibly important touchstones, and they are huge uh, uh, products of labor, because there's so much work that has to go into that was particularly with large of Simone, he's got 2,500 paintings, and every single one of them has got some kind of entry on it that requires a whole series of moles to be able to ferret out this information. Now, catalog essays like the Rembrandt catalog uh, are going to be debated. Uh, the most recent catalog resonate which has just appeared, you can see it online, therefore it doesn't cost you because many of these catalog resonates are hugely expensive. You can go online to uh, Mitchell Innes and Nash in New York, and David Nash has uh, redone the Cezanne catalog resume, at least for the painters. And it's a terrific idea to do it online because that way it can stay flexible, it doesn't, it doesn't have, it can, it can change, it doesn't go to the process uh, uh, problems of uh, printing and so on and so forth. So these are, these are, these are tested <coughs> little affairs. Uh, and in fact, um, they're very interesting. I've, I've become more and more interested in these things. I was involved with the BBC thing about a Renoir in the last couple of months. <coughs> and now I'm involved with a Cezanne, whether it's real or not real. It had been in the catalog. Then it got thrown out by John Rewald, a major scholar. He only threw three pictures out. Why would he have thrown this one out? We're still in the process of trying to, to find that out. So these things are very much. Yeah. Back to your original point, though, to have it in an exhibition, if it is questioned, then you have to have a serious conversation with your colleagues about whether in fact you're going to put it in or not. Mm. It turns out that I was so upset with some people about the money from the, the British uh, Navy that I did an exhibition of money in Japan and I put it in the exhibition to stick it to these other people because they were completely <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, remember, and, and give it some provenance, to give it a, a certain basis to go on. And then we can talk about it. You know, I don't think I'm wrong, but you know, if you present other evidence, I'm more than happy to uh, be open-minded about, about all of that. And museums do buy fakes. They're, every museum has a big boxes of fakes. I mean, the Art Institute of Chicago not that long ago bought a fake Gauguin sculpture. And it was in the catalog, we were talking about the catalog resonate, it was whereabouts unknown. And uh, a, a young man and his grandma created this Gauguin sculpture that no one knew what it looked like except for descriptions from, from the um, 1890s, I believe. And then they falsified all the um, archival documentation. And two of the most major Gauguin scholars in the world bought that sculpture. Mm -hmm. And then how it was did, how did they figure out that it was fake? 
Um, that's a, I, I kind of forgot that part of the story, but I think um, it was a, a ring of forgeries was discovered, and it was this young man and his and his lovely grandma. Um, <laughs> and then they went to jail, and I think he came forward. If, 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 maybe I got the story right. wrong. Then right. they came forward, and they're like, "Yeah, that one's fake too." So. Yeah. We curators, we don't like to have egg on our face, but it happens from time to time. There, there was a guy in Florida who came out uh, about three odd years ago as the, the painter who had faked all kinds of American paintings. And the Statue of Limitations was up on his crimes. And he could, in fact, say that pictures in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, this picture is here and there, this, and pictures were in the Catalan Resume. Ted Stebbins, one of the you know, uh, distinguished American scholars, uh, did a catalog resume uh, of a particular artist, and sure enough, two of those fakes are in his catalog resume. So we all can get faked out. Yes. We all can get faked out. It's, you know, and all there's a movie on that guy from Florida. Oh, is there oh, a movie? Oh, really? really? shows how he does it. This is so easy. You just throw coffee on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, he does all this stuff. Right? Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you very for that. Crazy. I, I thought he was very brazen, and at the same time, he was very proud. A lot of times, oh, he was. A lot of times, he was. He, 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 he's someone who has a real talent, and it's amazing because he, he, in fact, did lots of different kinds yes, of arts. It wasn't oh, yeah. one. Yeah, and lots uh, of it's a good film. Well, I'll have to take a look at that. One of the, then we'll, I'll get out of my thing off of this one, but one of the biggest scandals, and it's still unfolding, is the scandal about abstract expressionist pictures, Pollock, uh, de Kooning, uh, Rothko, and the like that a woman named Rosales out of Long Island and her cousin from, uh, from Madrid had been pushing through the old gallery called Nodler, which was the oldest gallery in America. Nodler is now closed. It's a scandal which is still evolving, and I'm sure you'll see, still see things in the press. Uh, one other thing that Jay had mentioned, the fact that you know, if you're going to do this every year, obviously you can't do major shows like that every year. Indeed, I'm not, I'm not sure how long the Monk show uh, took to organize, but most of them take three to five years minimum. <clears throat> so you're in this boat for a long, long time. And it better be fun at certain points <laughs> along the way, because otherwise it becomes you know, really a nightmare. Or really a nightmare. And um, the, the association with the trade is absolutely essential uh, because we're in our little towers to a certain degree, and these pictures circulate. Uh, they circulate oftentimes quite quickly, uh, and there's not necessarily a lot of record. The art market is one of the most uh, mm, shadowed, or no, not the wrong word, most gauzed uh, uh, markets, even despite the fact that it's billions and billions of dollars worth that is being traded. But you never necessarily know where the picture may be. It may be in that catalog of resume and saying that it's in, if it's in a museum, it's in a museum most of the time. Uh, but if it's in private hands, then you have to be able to track it. And tracking it requires a sleuthdom that you really need to develop. I'm very happy to say that my older brother was a real sleuth and uh, in different ways. I broke out of this campus many times. <laughs> it was not caught. <laughs> So I guess some of it sort of dribbled down, and I'll tell you a couple of stories in this regard. But the, the fact actually is the auction houses, Sotheby's, Christie's, uh, Phillips, and the like, are very important because they're the ones who know who owns certain works. And the only way I was able to do one of my first exhibitions, about in the 90s, that I'll focus on, was because I became very good friends with David Nash, who was the head of Modern Impressionist Pictures at Sotheby's. And we sat down in his corner office there in York, uh, Avenue. I had my book, and he had his book, and we we did some horse trading, uh, and we became very good friends. I was back in 1987, and we're still dear friends to this very day. He's a great guy, but you have to build trust. Trust is the only thing that is going to get you somewhere. If people don't trust you, they won't lend you the works. As Jay says, you have to go travel to see them. They want to see you in person. They want to know what you're like, whether you're good luck, you're good luck. <laughs> so, you know, that's totally crazy. Uh, or maybe he was just trying to play down the situation because yes. obviously you're, you're delightful looking. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't want to have his wife come and then, you know, say, oh, I'm not interested in her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> in any case, you really have to have the, the trust of the trade and the trust of dealers. And dealers are the ones who are really on the ground in terms of being in uh, contact with, with uh, collectors uh, and be able to have their confidence that you will maintain the kind of discretion that they require since these collectors are, for the most part, people who do not want to be known. Uh, in the contemporary world, we're a to totally different deal. Everybody wants to be known and throw around the kind of money that they're throwing around. But that's a, a very different uh, set of circumstances. So timing in terms of uh, how long it takes to get something done, the relationship with the trade. Uh, and um, at one time, years ago, art historians were really looked down upon if you were friendly with dealers. That was like, you were soiling your soul because they deal in money and they push things around. You're supposed to be more elevated, which I thought was really malarkey to begin with. And uh, actually, uh, there are many, many dear friends uh, in the trade, and that has been enormously successful. Um, so I, I'd like to talk uh, about uh, the man who I've uh, been so allied with uh, all these years. Happily, I have uh, branched out. Most people say I'm only a money guy, but in a book on Manet, and I've done contemporary things, and Kenneth Nolan, and David Smith, and uh, other stuff too, but Monet is really my man. Monet yeah. is my <laughs> man. And I am so proud and so happy to have been aligned with him for all of these years. He is amazing. Uh, he was born in 1840, then died until 1926. So he lived, you know, a quarter of his life in the 20th century, which we often forget. We push him back into the past. <laughs> he was someone who, in his 80s, did his best work. It lies in front of us. Man. It lies in front of us. I don't think we're all you know done at the moment. And that to me is awe-inspiring in the best of ways. Uh, we see him there on the right-hand side in his studio there in G Valley, uh, in front of those monstrous, magnificent, monumental water lilies, which are now in the two rooms of the Angerie, which he began in uh, the years of the war. Uh, and which he donated to France uh, in the, uh, at the end of the war and actually had installed in 1927. He didn't actually see them installed themselves, but they are some of the most magnificent rooms uh, in the history of art. And I urge you, if you go, uh, to go to, if you go to Paris, go to the Angerie, pay the big bucks. It's very expensive to get in, but I guarantee you it's worth it. It's really a magnificent. They recently restored it. It's quite beautiful. Uh, in any case, he's someone who has taught me an enormous amount someone who's led me around the world, I'm sure, like Munk as well, both to uh, sites where his paintings were painted, which are terribly important. Being a landscape man as he is, you have to see, literally see what he is painting uh, to be able to understand what his pictures really look like. Uh, that, to me, has been one of the great pleasures about it. Uh, I, the only place I've not been, ironically, I haven't thought about this until this very moment, the only place I have not been where he painted is Norway, <laughs> where Munch was born. So, uh, in any case, at some point. Uh, in fact, uh, we were saying to, to uh, about, oh, that's, that's, that, hold on, which one's forward, that's backwards, that's here, and that's it. I was talking about, about to Jim, saying, you know, the, I, I couldn't imagine having written a dissertation, as I'm sure, Jay, you thought about it as well, the idea of writing a dissertation, two or three hundred pages, you've got to be kidding. And then that dissertation was the Monet and Archive book, which became a book, and then I thought, all right, that was, that was successful as a study of the 1870s. I knew somebody else was working on the 1880s. I said, well, I'll, I'll take a look at the 1890s, which became the Monet in the 90s book. Uh, and then after that, then sort of concentrated on the series. And then I said, well, we really should, we need a book that's going to tell the whole story. And that became The Monet Life and Art from 1995. And then The Monet in the 20th Century was an invitation that came from having done The Monet in the 90s show <clears throat> to be able to look at Monet's 20th century work. So I never had it all planned out, as, as Jay suggested before. These things evolve. Uh, and happily, this has been a terrific train to have been on, I guarantee you. The service has been terrific. <laughs> in fact, so, so associated with the man have, have I been that friends, relatives, wives are constantly saying, you're really just channeling the guy. <laughs> you know, he, he needed a voice, so so there you are. Uh, in fact, when she's been out a thousand times, the first time that we went with our two children was in the winter. 
uh, we were going to Paris for Sunday or other, and they said, Papa, Papa, you can, I said, it's close. He said, no, no, you can get us in. You can get us in, I'm sure. So I call up, we go. And what they will retain from that visit was not the glories of that environment, because of course it was winter, but rather two large traps that were on the side of the banks of the pond, inside of which were muskrats. <laughs> and that was much more fascinating than anything else. Muskrats eat water lilies and were a big problem when <laughs> they were set themselves alive, so they do trap them in a happy way, I guess. I don't know. We didn't eat them or anything else. Um, let's see. One of the things that is certainly true is that over the course of these 25, 35 years of working on him, that prices have just risen enormously. That's true with a whole variety of artists, but particularly with contemporary. You have to separate out contemporary art really from everything else because it has no, no relative uh, uh, sort of correlation. Uh, you could buy, for example, an entire old master auction at Christie's or Sotheby's for the price of that Picasso from 175 minutes, 179 million dollars. The whole auction, you could buy every single work of art out of thing, but people are not interested in that. The one thing I find terrific is that my man has held up. Okay. <laughs> he is in there. He is in there. Right? In fact, in the most recent auction this past spring, where Sotheby's did, they, they put a couple of uh, uh, 19th century works in with contemporary things. There was a Monet of the Houses of Parliament. That baby made 40 million. All right? <laughs> 40 million. It's, it's great. That's a man. And I say that with enthusiasm because he too was interested in money at the time, and I'm sure he is gloated. The highest price paid for a money was in fact at this very auction right here, where Christopher Burge, the auctioneer for Christie's, is pointing to a terrible reproduction of a very large money, two meters by one meter, that went for $80 million. And he is leaning down to this uh, wonderful woman over here, who's a dear friend, saying to her, Take as much time as you would like. <laughs> that was when they were somewhere in the vicinity of low seven, uh, uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, seven, I think like seven, 72, 73 million dollars, something like that. In any case, 80 million dollars. Crazy price. You couldn't get that necessarily for this picture today, but maybe. Uh, what is also true, if I do that one more time, I'll shoot myself. <laughs> what is also true is it's become big business. We talk about authentication, that's why I, I sort of liked your question. I just, uh, sheer happenstance, Free, Freeman Art there upon the right, you can go on the internet and I don't know who this person is, male or female, what the organization is, but look it up on the internet, Freeman Art, and they will authenticate your work of art, this Monet. They have, I have no idea, it's a complete sham. It's a complete <laughs> and utter sham. Getting your money's worth is actually the title of an exhibition that was a contest at the Royal Academy in London where they had contemporary artists paint works of art and be able to see if they were going to pass the muster of a, of a particular jury and then they were going to sell them at the end. The, at, at the, uh, uh, show Me the Money was also another one of those BBC kinds of things. And then someone trying to be able to be me, Paul Hayes, <laughs> in the left hand side, oh. cash in the attic. <laughs> they, they just dropped the tucker for my protection. I had my lawyers make sure that I was not in the photograph as well. The whole idea there was to be able to, of course, find works of art that might be in your attic or your closet and we'll auction them off. We'll make money. It's all about money. It wasn't years ago all about money. It was really about the work. And this is something that's been sincerely and solely lost. In fact, it's, it's gotten so crazy that Dolce Gabbana in 2008 had a line of clothing for water lilies. So here's this fantastically beautiful dress. I mean, it's an incredible dress. It is modeled after the water lily there upon the right hand side. I have no idea how expensive that dress is. But it's not just, of course, the dresses and the fashion. It's also the hipsters, <laughs> the hipsters, like these, these babies, you can get this on the internet, even today, right now, right? So you can be as cool and groovy as Monet was as well. So, and this is what happens when you do these big exhibitions, at least with an artist who's colorful, not one who's crazy and drunk and, uh, and has all these psychological problems, as Mr. Monk does. Although Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone modeled that image uh, after the screen as well. Anyway, Monet uh, really is all about, in some ways, all about this extension out from the work itself. But he is an artist of such consummate skill and such diversity. Uh, for example, one of the great shows at the Clark uh, in the last couple of years was, in fact, showing the public 
that he was actually a terrific draftsman. Began his career really as a draftsman, as a caricaturist here at the left hand side, wonderful views of the Normandy coast there upon the right, and when he's in London doing these pastels there on the right hand side as well. Many people didn't know this. Uh, in part because those works have been obviously less circulating in the public realm, uh, and he's often known more obviously as a painter, but those drawings are fabulous. And there's lots of things to discover about this artist, and who, as I said, who has taught me an enormous amount. We think of him as a painter of flowing fields and gardens and beautiful women, but he painted lots of pretty tough pictures, like factories such as you have here, or an image which looks more like Gary, Indiana, or Pittsburgh, PA in earlier years than the beauties of Impressionist France. And all of these are intentional. They all have meaning. And just like Jay being able to find all those letters and realize that the monk was a calculating businessman, so too was Monet. And he had many dimensions to his personality and many meanings to his pictures. In fact, the, the picture, which in theory is the emblem for Impressionism, is this one here called Impression Sunrise of the Musée Marmaton. And nobody had ever really looked in the background here, but these are pack boats over there and factories back over here, puffing out smoke here with big five-masted clipper ships that are actually coming from, uh, from New Orleans, bringing cotton to be able to be uh, milled in these factories here in Lava. Here on the right-hand side are actually cranes, thanks to Billy Gilbane and Gilbane Construction, <laughs> <laughs> who are enlarging the port here upon the right-hand side. And it's being done, of course, at a moment in the, in the uh, early 1870s, where you literally have a sun over here rising, a new sun rising, because it was just after the Franco-Prussian War, where France had been destroyed, humiliated, and this is a painting about France rising, amongst many other things. And in fact, that patriotic dimension of Monet's has long been neglected, and one of the great uh, prides I have is sort of trying to restore that in various ways. There are lots of pictures that emphasize that, like, for example, this picture from the Met, where you have the flag of Lafayette over here and the French tricolore over there on the right, silhouetted against the rectangle of that blue sky as an example of where France and, of course, Monet's roots lie. This is his father over here and his aunt. They're looking out here again on those great big ships that are coming into Lafayette, but just around the left hand side, to which his father and his aunt are supplying all the chancery materials. So they literally are feeding those ships as they come in. This, therefore, is a moment of earned leisure as you are here upon your balcony, just as Monet celebrates one of the great holidays here upon the right hand side with all those tricolaires as well. The same is true, finally, really, even with the water lilies, because those water lilies began with Monet's offer of a gift of this painting here upon the right, and one water lily, uh, this painting here, done during the war, traumatized as this tree trunk is, much like Monet himself, who heard those guns rattling there in Givalny, and even gave food to victims that were being housed in Givalny itself. So it is a patriotic gesture. It's someone who is a man who believes in his country and who wants to be able to make art therefrom. In fact, that really is the heart of this Monet in the 90s exhibition, which occurred at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, at the Art Institute of Chicago, and went on to the Royal Academy of London in 1990. There happened, it just happened to be 1990. It was called the Monet in the 90s. There were some people, I would say, said, really, he's still painting? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't deny that fact, however. Uh, in any case, uh, the point really was to reunite what became known as the series paintings. In the 1890s, he began painting pictures in series. So he painted, for example, 30 of these stack pictures. Uh, he went on and painted, in fact, uh, 30 of these cathedral pictures. And they've been scattered throughout the world, except at, uh, at uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, which actually has five of them. The, uh, Musée d'Orsay in Paris also has four of them, but other than that, there's sort of one or two all around the world. They never had been gathered since Monet exhibited them in the 1890s. And the origins of this idea came from Williamstown. The Clark Art Institute owns a cathedral painting that George Hurd Hamilton, distinguished art historian, purchased as his first purchase for the Clark, and I love that painting. And as a art history major in my senior year, I was allowed to give tours of the artists uh, of the Clark, and I'd always end with that picture. 
saying, wouldn't it be wonderful someday to reunite those cathedral paintings? You know, that was an undergraduate romance, and it became a reality about 20 years later. So it was deeply satisfying to have these together, and it was very moving also because, of course, the Gothic cathedral, the world cathedral, is in that Gothic style. The Gothic was established in France with Saint-Denis in 1099. It was exported throughout Europe and even here in the United States. It is a distinctly French style. And France was under enormous pressure in the 1890s to be able to reassert itself as a cultural, its cultural hegemony against the pressures of America and a variety of other concerns. Uh, and the other factor, in, in of course, organizing these shows is just getting them together. Uh, one, is, as Jay says, they're scattered throughout the world. And when we began this project, we actually didn't know where literally half of these series paintings were. There were people who said, it ain't going to happen because if you don't get enough of them, it's really not going to make a difference. And I vowed that even though there's some series that only have four pictures, we had to get at least three for every one. And for the larger ones, like the cathedrals or stack pictures, I wanted to get at least 10 to 15 of them. So really, you would have the impact of what Monet had, in fact, intended, which nobody had seen since the 1890s. So in point of fact, uh, we were able to achieve that. We actually had 15 stacks. We had 11 cathedral paintings and many others throughout the, the, the series as a whole. There were there were stumbling points along the way. For example, these two fabulous cathedral pictures are at the National Gallery in Washington. And they were given by Mr. Widener, and Mr. Widener said that, in fact, they can never leave the museum. And that is true with a variety of other pictures. For example, if some of you are Connecticutians, uh, I would urge you to go to the Hillstead Museum in Farmington, Connecticut. They've got two beautiful stack pictures, and they wept, as did the director of the museum uh, at the time uh, of, the, of the National Gallery, because they can't lend them. The Hillstead pictures have to stay at the Hillstead, so I urge you to go. It's a fabulous uh, trip and a wonderful museum. So those are out. In any case, there are other problems, too. <coughs> Uh, this is not. This is making Peter a little uneasy down here. <laughs> uh, but you know, p pictures are put at risk. There is no doubt about that. Hand art handling has gotten a hundred and fifty percent better. But there are times where terrible things occur. Forklifts go through the uh, the crate and comes back with nice little slits in them. Or in this particular case, I don't know if you had seen this a couple of years ago, but in Dublin. A visitor to the museum literally punched this mummy and caused that tear. Right? It is now all sewn up, you can't tell the difference, but it is no longer what it was. So there's a natural uneasiness in the part of collectors to be able to resist that. That's why you need to convince them, in my case, was that you own one of the cousins and we are having a family reunion and yeah. your cousin will be sorely missed and will demean my Uncle John and Aunt Jane if it's not there. And they finally understood that mostly. One of the things about handling, however, is you have to be pretty delicate about that. And I do not understand this photograph. <laughs> Here is a woman who is, in theory, by herself, <laughs> holding a very heavy painting with a serious frame. <clears throat> it's a Sotheby's uh, uh, picture. It is really not the kind of picture you would want to put out, but it probably makes it look as if even a lovely woman in this case can, in fact, touch this painting with gloves, I might add. But it's really not the way things happen in the museum world. Or, mm, not generally, but it happens frequently in other situations, as we can see over here again as well. You know, you can see the photography. You can get the woman over there, pose there as if she's got to like, straighten the, the painting out. Not the kind of thing you should be doing. Nor should you necessarily be touching it. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is not the Muppets at the Met. <laughs> Now, this person is indefinitely touching the picture because he wants to see if it's relined. Mm -hmm. And he's pushing against the surface of the picture. And if it's relined, meaning that this original canvas is under some stress, that they'll put a new canvas on the back of the picture. And if, it's, if that is done, then sometimes the surface of the picture is in fact compromised because it's done generally by turning the painting upside down and pressing another one on the back of it. 
So you can generally tell whether in fact it is an issue. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a dangerous but sometimes absolutely important process. Which then raises the issue about, all right, if it's hanging on the wall, how is it supposed to look even if you don't touch it? Well, this happens to be a photograph slightly out of focus. I apologize, but I took it anyway because I brought it in anyway because it is a terrific cathedral painting that is hanging at the Getty. And the Getty had at one time placed it in a room in which there was a skylight. And so you could, you could see, no deer, you could see the light cascading across the surface. Isn't that beautiful? No, it's not. It's not, it's not beautiful and it's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. You want, to have, you want to have a consistent, clear light. And the lighting in these exhibitions is highly technical. Very trained people do it. Next time you're at a show, just look at the lighting. Or just look at the frame. Don't bother looking at the works and then come back and look at the works next time. But it's a very careful process that makes all the difference in the world. Then it comes down to the issue of, about quality. You want to be able to show the best pictures you can get. And the, Modi got up every day and he didn't paint a fabulous picture every day. He painted a lot of fabulous pictures. And for example, there was a choice between the picture on the left-hand side and the picture on the right-hand side. I bet you if I go to take a quiz in this room, <coughs> that everybody would get this right. The picture you would want for the show is the one on the right-hand side, right? It's much more interesting in terms of color. Both of them are sketches or unfinished pictures. I thought it was very important to show an unfinished painting so you could then see the progression to a finished picture. The one on the left-hand side is actually much smaller. It's a little bit drabber in terms of color. The drawing isn't as interesting. The way the picture, the way the, uh, the cathedral sits on the surface is not interesting. So you don't need to bother with that. And he didn't, he didn't like the picture that much either because it's really unfinished. So you can make a logistical and logical choice in those regards too. Another thing about condition, but I just spoke about relining. This picture looks beautiful, uh, and I was keenly interested in it for my Money in the 20th Century show, but when I saw it in Chicago for an exhibition in 1995, uh, it is, you could in fact skate on this painting. It was relined and was so clamped down, it's so hard, you probably hurt your finger if you bang against it. So the entire surface has been ruined. It looks terrific in, in reproduction, and that's something you really want to avoid when you are doing these kinds of exhibitions. Again, the biggest challenge of the Mona Lisa was just one finding all these pictures and then actually getting them. Uh, the series actually began not in the 90s, but rather in the 1880s with pictures like this over here. So I was keenly interested to get them because they're different from the way the series ends with these great big stacks on the left. This picture is in Saitama, Japan, and we were able to obtain that loan. This picture was in the, uh, the Finley family, uh, Mrs. Finley, and I put that out there. That can, in fact, be widely distributed. Uh, the Finleys are some of the oldest dealers uh, in New York. Wally Finley is a cousin. David Finley is Americanist. Peter Finley had been a terrific 19th, 20th century person. I go to see Peter, a Williams guy. He says, sure, it's in my mom's house. Here's her address, write her a letter. Good luck. <laughs> All right. yeah. So I wrote her, and I wrote her, and I wrote her. As Jay said, you've got to write these things over and over again. And this is pre-internet, pre-computer, so you've got to do it on the typewriter. Uh, an endless number of letters. Needless to say, she would not budge. And Peter said, you know what? Told you. She is just that way. So I was really, really upset because it had been a picture that had not been seen since 1910. Mm -hmm. And so I was more pained. Well, you know, patience and what goes around comes around. This letter writing started in 1987. In 1989, she was somewhere in her early 90s and she decided to sell the picture. It went up for auction and died. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Take that. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> About frames. So I'm pretty sure that there's a They all came with the frame. We actually went through some debate about whether to take all the frames off uh, and reframe them all so that they'd all be the same, or conversely, have one room where they all would be naked, uh, which I thought would be like really startling. You, it would be as if you're in the studio. 
but that also gets a little, got a little too curious, you know, it would be too oddball -y. They all came in different frames and we left them in different frames. There were one or two that we actually reframed, but Monet didn't have the exact same frame for every picture of either, so it was a kind of about some frames were horrible, some frames were fun. This is a St. Cain, it's a beautiful picture, it's now still in a private collection, uh, but it really began in this series. And this picture up here is focused on attention. It's part of a group of paintings, like one of the artists to the Chicago. Uh, there are four of them. And again, I needed three of the four. One was in the South, buried in the South American collection. One was in the collection of San Francisco, Chris. One was in a collection uh, that had only a reference to it. It had not been on the public market since the 1890s. Right? And, I, and I had no idea where it was. One day, I'm uh, I, at the museum, I get a call, say somebody's on the line for you, I get on the phone, and it's a woman who says, I think I got a picture for you. I said, uh, really? Because I was just in New York, I live in Palm Beach, I was just in New York, and I was reading the New York Times, and the Sunday section of the New York Times had a review of a book on Impressionism, and in that happened to be my mentor's, Bob Herbert's book that was being reviewed, and in that review it mentioned that some of his students were doing things like you, doing a show on Mara in the 90s. Uh, I said, yes? And she said, well, it's a picture of a little house that sits on a cliff. I said, really? I said, do you know what year it is? She said, I'm not really sure, but I think it's the 1890s. Make a long story short, it was, in fact, this very picture. It had been purchased by her, par her husband's parents uh, and had been in their apartment in New York and then on Long Island for all of those years until they all moved. And then it sat in storage in Herka's warehouse for easily 20 years. Oh, so we go to the storeroom with my son Jonathan, who this woman still remembers. Uh, having kids along always does help. I thought this would be a good one. Right? You know, just kind of got to plan it out a little bit, you know, take a little bit of a risk. Uh, we go to the storeroom. It was simply on, uh, inside this, ca this cupboard. There was nothing else in it. Dust ridden. It was just a kind of tarp over the thing. We pulled that out. It was filthy dirty, but it was the real deal. A real deal. It wasn't a Monet in the attic, but it was in the storage. We, <laughs> we cleaned it. It cleaned up beautifully. Uh, and in fact, uh, it is uh, really this incredibly delicate picture. It's a beautiful atmospheric effects. And therefore, we got the three of the four. Uh, and in the end, it was a marvelous series. And there I am because of my fact, she lent it to the Dow to the Denver Art Museum. And I was in Denver a year or so ago, and I had to have my wife take a photograph of me in front of the picture so I could show her that, in fact, my heart still lay there on that clip with her as well. Um, a final example of this kind of hunt and search. Monet, in 1889, went to the Creuse Valley in the Dordogne, a very rough and tumble area, uh, even still to this day, as the photograph here suggests. Uh, and he <coughs> painted a number of pictures, like this one here upon the left-hand side, of these amazing cliffs over here. This is this cliff right over there. Uh, and he really became passionate about these pictures. They're unusual pictures, and they're pictures which in, 18, in the 18, excuse me, in the 1980s were very little known. You could almost give these paintings away. Uh, they really had almost no monetary value, $40,000, maybe $50,000. In any case, the MFA had two of them, one of them here on the left-hand side. And I was keen to be able to start the whole exhibition and base the idea of series upon this group from 1889, because they were completed as a group, they were shown as a group, and they were reviewed and remarked upon as a group. So here's just a, a smattering of them. However, the picture that became of keenest interest is this one here. And that's because it was owned by two women, two sisters in Boston, who had exhibited once in the 1890s, and it had not been seen since 1905. And I said, I'm going to get this picture. And I'm going to get it because it came up for sale at Sotheby's in 1969. I had the catalog for it. There's the image of it. Da, da, da. I go to Sotheby's. Sotheby's, at that time, this was, in, again, in the late 80s, literally had no kinds of automated record keeping. They literally had shoe boxes with cards in them. I mean, it sounds utterly medieval. And they did not know who, in fact, had bought the painting. They thought that a woman whose name is Madame Blatas, who was an old dealer in Paris, had consigned it. Boom, on that plate in Paris, go see Madame Blatas. 
I sit there, she is in fact quite elderly, we have a lovely conversation, I bring the actual physical catalog uh, to her, and she's looking at it, she says, oh yes, I sold that Daumier, oh, oh yes, that Renoir was mine. So she remembered those things, she kept looking at this picture and says, hmm, I don't remember that. She said, you know what, I, know, I remember who bought that picture. <laughs> Liz Taylor bought the picture. I said, Liz Taylor bought the picture. Really? This is great. Uh, Boston's going to like this one. Right? So what is it? she says, yeah, in fact, I remember the auction room. Liz was on one side of the room and Richard was on the other. And they were bidding against each other, even though they were still a couple. I said, this is great. Love the story. This is fine. Blah, blah. I can go through all the connections to be able to find her agent, her writer, and everything else. We're now coming up to the time when the show is supposed to open and the book is going to go to print. And she agrees to, in fact, have, and we finally got all of her, on a Friday, she agreed to have a photographer come to her Belle Eagle's house, photograph the painting, FedEx it out on Monday, boom, I'm there at the museum, I hold it up. It's not this painting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's another moment. Like, I call the photographer up, I say, Jay, this is the wrong picture. Did, didn't you know there was a Coles Valley picture? He says, this is the only one they showed me. Oh. I said, well, didn't you look around? <laughs> I said, no, in fact, I, you know, just was there. I said, oh, we're back to square one. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I was back on a plane to Paris uh, by the end of the week to see Madame Blatas again. Madame Blatas, by this time, had had a hip operation. <laughs> so uh, her maid is, it says, I'll get her upstairs. What do I do? I scoured that front door. I am in every room because I figured she had led me on some kind of wives' tale to be able to find find the picture through through Liz Taylor. No picture. And I, I immediately get my seat. Lady Bird comes down. She's fine. Da, da, da. We chit chat away, and she still didn't know. She just did not know. And I thought I am I'm dead in the water. I go back to Sotheby's yet again, and they said, well, you know. Maybe the picture got bought in, and it did not sell. I said, okay, that means that somebody didn't, didn't buy it, so they take it back, and they had to send it back to a consigner. Uh, and they looked into that, and they found that actually what had happened was the consigner had then sold it at the Hotel Warwick in Houston, Texas in 1970. Mm -hmm. Boom, we got a trail. <clears throat> Nothing happened. There's no catalog for it, there's no nothing, blah, blah. A week before the show opens, I get a call. <coughs> oh, is this Professor Tucker? He yeah. says, well, I heard you're organizing an exhibition there in Boston, and I think I may have a, a painting you may want. I say, you don't happen to have purchased in the Houston, Texas, Hotel Walker, and I can tell me a picture of 1889, did you? He says, yes, I did. I love that painting. I love that painting a lot. I said, well, I'd love to see it. And I'd love to have a couple of us. And long story short, he was friends with David Krieger, who was the person who founded Geico 100 years ago. And they were buddies. And David had led two paintings to the show. And he told him about the show and put in a good word for me. He said I was a reasonable guy. And the painting came to the show after the press opening. We actually had to move all the paintings in the first room to put this baby back in there, but it came back to Boston after all of those years away. Um, there are many things to be learned in doing these exhibitions. Many things to be learned about Monet. For example, I didn't know that in fact, <clears throat> in a famous city made famous by Monet through a series of painting prompted Honda to withdraw from the F1 1968 uh, racetrack team, right? It, this is amazing. Here's the, there was a there was a race in Monet's team, and you get know, all that all that sort of Formula One stuff is such a big deal. And here's Monet with Formula One people. Are you kidding? There he is. That's not Monet. That's in fact the Formula One guy who withdrew from Honda, but it was in fact a race in Rouen where this was being held. So Monet gets associated with Rouen, gets associated with Formula One, and so so other things. Of course, Linnea's garden. We all should have written that book, let me tell you. We'd be building new buildings here at Canterbury if that were the case. And of course, as some of you may remember, if you saw, in fact, Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, <clears throat> almost never, nobody I ever asked could remember, but the very first scene of that movie is Owen, um, Wilson. Owen Wilson and Rachel McAdams. 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 Thank you. 
A bridge for Gavis on Monet's bridge at Givaldi. And it's symbolic on many levels, Woody Allen's love of Paris, but romance starts in this garden. And it's romance of Monet's pictures, which were that inspiration, which you two can paint. You can now go onto YouTube and think, this guy's going to tell you how to paint Monet. <laughs> how great is that? It's not even paint by number. You can do it yourself. <laughs> but best of all, this is what really makes me love. She's a full-on Monet. This is, of course, you know, uh, uh, Alicia Silverstone in Clueless. She's a full-on Monet. It's like a pain, see? From far away it's okay, but you got to be close, it's a whole big mess. Now this girl needs some education. And that's what these exhibitions are always about, at least from my point of view. The pictures have got to educate in some way or the other. And so, as the New Yorker will always tell us so wisely, here's Monet and Manet first meeting, which occurred actually in the 1860s. You're Monet? Uh, I think so. Uh, but, oh, long I thought, right, I mean, I guess so. Wait, no, I'm Manet. You're Monet. Hold on, I've got it written down here somewhere. <laughs> One of the classic lines I've ever overheard in the National Gallery that occurred was two women looking at a Monet. And one turned, this is true, honest truth, turns the other and says, now, is it Monet or is it Manet? Oh. And the other woman says, I've heard it both ways, so I guess both are okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, why we need, that's why we need education. Tell us again about Monet, Grandpa. That's what we need. We need to be told again about Monet so that the loneliness of the curator there on his, on his pad with his Monet, Monet with the Monet in the 90s shirt here and the Monet in the 90s bag, the loneliness there as we struggle to be able to get those pictures and make sense of the world has fruition. Thank you. So, I'm exhausted, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, just looking, just thinking about all that, it's like, it's oh, exhausting. God, it's exhausting. But if there are any questions or queries, or... Yes? You raised lighting before. Yes. Yeah. If my wife were here, she'd be embarrassed that I even raised this question. Should. But when did people start, when did preparators, I guess, start pin lighting paintings? And why don't they start? There's all different kinds of lighting. I mean, there's pin lighting, and then there's what you call wash lighting. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of homes or museums, it's really about the atmosphere you want to cr create. If you want to have a really dark room with spots on it, that's a very dramatic. If you want to have a wash light, it's <laughs> more even. But I mean, sections of the painting. So the, the nice yellow lemon in the Zubaran, as though he hadn't emphasized it enough. If you go to the yeah. museum, there's a little three or four stops, brighter light on the lemon. That does not. I, I agree with Paul. It's lot. much better. It does happen a lot. I agree that it's much better if it's uniform. So you see the entire painting yeah. the, the, the exact same way. That's what he meant. Yeah. yeah. That little sketch uh, of the cathedral mm -hmm. right. that was not the stuff. Why would he have even signed that? Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, it's actually stamped. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not signed. And after Monet's death uh, in 1926, there were a lot of pictures still in the studio even earlier pictures. And over time, he only had one son that had survived uh, and several uh, stepchildren. Over time, they, particularly in the, after the Second World War, they developed a stamp that looked pretty much like the signature, but not exactly. And they just sell paintings, because a lot of people might not think that that was a real Monet. It doesn't really look like a real Monet. So they would stamp it, and everybody would feel a little better, and then, here's a little trick, they stamp it on the back. They stamp it on the back just as a quick, like, hmm, you know? You might want to try faking the signature on the front, because, back to your question, there are lots of Monet well, fakes that are not very good for the most part, but there are lots of out there. And so, to be able to cover themselves, they would stamp on the back. Too. And there's, there's also a tricky thing. Um, there's a drawing the museum I work at, the Clark, by um, Eugène Delacroix, who was very important mid-19th century French romantic. And everyone thought it was a Delacroix. It hadn't been published that many times. It was about to go on an exhibition. Some uh, former um, career at the Frick, Colin Bailey, wanted it in a show he and I were organizing together. And I said, you know what? 
I'm just not sure about that drawing. Is there's an estate stamp? What's wrong with it? It's fine. I said it, something is not right with the drawing, and that's always my before I publish anything, put it in an exhibition, buy anything for a museum. I have my own personal policy is I assume it's fake until I can prove it's real, because I don't want anything going up. Long story short, it's not by Delacroix. It's a fake estate stamp that was created after his death. And there's one art historian, she is at Grinnell College, Susan Strauber, who can tell a real Delacroix estate stamp from a fake one. Um, so it's, it was bought as Delacroix, and it is now, a, it's, it's, we don't know who it's bought, but it's, it's a great, great drawing, but it's been demoted. <laughs> <laughs> so when a museum lends you a work, is it, so an implicit understanding that five years from now I could go back to you and say, uh, you know, that sergeant, uh, uh, bring it over and, and you know, those sort, those sorts of bonds where, where it's expected that you are going, if I yeah. do a solid for you, you're going to do one for me. That, that, that kind of forced trading is becoming more and more important with museum exhibitions. Um, so it definitely happens. It's not always. There's plenty of times that museums will lend to one another, and they don't ever ask for anything back because it's the right thing to do. It's a scholarly exhibition. It's an important contribution to the literature and to the field. Um, but oftentimes, we remember, <laughs> and they remember. <laughs> so, I guess the, the other question about uh, these blockbusters, uh, and I've often wondered this, do they actually create uh, a uh, enough of an interest in a significant number of people so that they want to come to the museum to see just the collection at large or is it really just a kind of a standalone experience and have you done any research on there's, Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of research done on that and I think a, a lot of museums, I think if, if all you're going to do is do blockbusters and you're not going to do other kinds of non-blockbuster scholarship and exhibitions, what some museums do is they say, alright, we're going to do a great Monet exhibition um, in the summer. And that allows us to do an exhibition in the fall of a relatively unknown artist that we can do really interesting research on. And one will sort of pay for the other. Um, but I think it's it has been shown museums that only do blockbusters, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't sustain. Right. You know, there has to be in the permanent collection always helps. But you may have a different opinion on that. Well there's always a spike in membership. And membership is like really the heart blood yeah. of museums and really important. So in whatever Town or city you live in, do be a member of your museum. Uh, it's a kind of civic thing to do. Uh, but there's always a spike. And then that spike, you know, softens over time. Uh, it's sort of just sort of natural evolution. But it's really hard to do one blockbuster after another, like even for big museums. Uh, it's hard not only just to all the labor that goes into it, it's hard on the building, it's hard on the staff. Some of our dearest friends at the MFA were the coat check women because they are seriously put upon. Uh, and it really it drains, it drains the institution in that way. So you have to be, you know, good directors have to be sensitive to that larger, that larger picture. And they're more and more expensive um, with corporate sponsorships going down. Um, the government is giving less money to the NEA, the NEH um, to exhibitions. That they're expensive too. So you can't, museums can't, often can't do them year after year. So I'm realizing we have just a couple more minutes left. We don't want to keep you all hostage. Maybe um, one more question before we adjourn. I have a question for you, Paul. Uh, how, how did you become so captivated by Monet to the point that you devoted your life to this one artist? Did this happen kind of early, or was this uh, an evolutionary process for you? Uh, it wasn't an evolutionary process. I mean, if I had my brothers, I would have loved to have worked on Cezanne, would have loved to have worked on Matisse, uh, happily, as I said, uh, I've been able to work on David Smith, who I think is one of the greatest sculptors of the 20th century. Uh, oftentimes, it's really just the opportunities that come along, but each one of those books only happened because, well, certainly if the, if the Money and Archer book hadn't been successful and the questions that had been asked of those pictures hadn't been, uh, been proven to be, or at least amongst most people, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be legit and raising other issues, then it would have been harder to do, apply the same kind of methodology to, to later ones. So it's kind of uh, internal and kind of uh, uh, had, had its own life. But at the same time, as I say, he is so rewarding. I just unbelievably rewarding. I, and it amazes me mm. that, that I can go and still look at pictures and say, wow, 
look at what he did over here, or look how smart that is. He was a really smart guy, and he never let up, even though he didn't paint great pictures every single day. They said he painted a lot of really great pictures, and that's really hard to do. And he was as tough on himself as he was on anybody else. So he was a kind of inspiration in that regard, that he really provides a kind of self-analysis that is also juice for the engine. Perfect note to end on. Thank yeah. you all so much.